Okay, I get called father of the Miata, and I'm not too comfortable with that. Because, I mean, there are people that say, oh, you're father of the Miata, oh, it's Tom Matano's car. It's, it's actually uh, a guy named Hirai's car. And Mr. Hirai was the first program manager. And I did, I, I had this idea for a concept for a low cost front engine rear drive convertible, the top that folded. And it was an idea, and I think it was a good idea. And in, before I joined Mazda, I used to visit Mr. Yamamoto, who's had a product development. And he asked me right off the top, he says, what should we do after the RX-7? And I said, how about this cheap sports car? And he was poker faced and said, okay. And forgotten about it. Two years later, they hire me. And I thought I was going to be put in PR or something. They put me in the design center in California. I'm working the B-Series pickup truck. And in February, I get this tap on my shoulder from this guy. He's Mr. Yamamoto, sitting from Japan. I say, hi, boss, what is it? He says, oh, bob what are you doing? B-Series pickup truck. He says, you should be doing the sports car project. I had forgotten about it. So he actually went to my boss and he said, two hours later, my boss came and said, Mr. Yamamoto said, you should work on the lightweight sports, and I agree. So we've agreed you can work on it as much as you want before 8.30 in the morning, and you can work on it as much as you want between 12 and 1, and you can work on it as much as you want after 5.30. And beginning the next day, and for seven years, I came in at six in the morning. Seven years. Yeah, so that I could I could focus on that before the phones rang or anything else. And and at, when it became an official project, I still came in early because I get more work done. Um, so I guess I had this concept, but What's without the concept based on it was it was based on a car that was involving fun to drive, traditional sports car characteristics, top down, wind in the hair motoring. Uh, kiss car, keep it simple, and so that nobody who, if you saw the concept, if you saw the car, you understood the concept, and if you read the concept, you understood what the car would be. Completely, just, just straightforward like that. There was no interpretation required. You understood it. You either got it or you didn't, and everybody got it. And in that regard... From the beginning, the company understood it. So at certain, certain people in the company understood it from the start, certain didn't. And, and it helped when others came on. Mark Jordan joined in 1982, Tom came in in 83, Matano, and we were able, we got Japan interested enough that we were able to do a full-scale clay model. Once they saw that, they started to understand. And at the start, when I had someone ask me, they said, how many of these cars do they currently sell in the US? And the only people selling were Fiat with the Spider, the 124 Spider at that time called the Pininfarina Spider because Fiat had pulled out, and Alfa Romeo. So I said 2,000 cars per year. Now, 2,000 cars per year, or two, they would never do it. But we, we planted the seed of an idea that this car was, we knew, for example, there was a second generation RX-7 coming up that would move up from where the car was. So we called it a lead-in car to the RX-7. It was training wheels. Tell me about Mr. Hirai. Toshihiko Hirai, very interesting character. He was near retirement. It was widely believed the MX-5 would be his last project. And internally, the other program managers thought the project and the car would fail. Didn't. <laughs> it didn't fail because. It, it didn't fail because. Because Hirai-san had, he was, he was a great program manager because he had that ability to listen to outside input. He, he trusted his own, but he also, he, there were things he knew he didn't know and he wasn't afraid to ask. And, and it was very constructive. He had his people coming in, pitching ideas. It wasn't just what I think this car should be as the program manager. It's what I wanted to make so that the customer would be happy, and that worked what was, brilliantly. What was the special, what was the very special thing that Mr. Harai brought that made this car a success, the one thing you could point to? I think Harai's gift in terms of bringing in was a kind of passion, but not the passion you imagine as a driver or a motoring enthusiast, but the passion he had was making the car the best car for the customer so they understood the experience. And, and that was absolutely critical and, and probably the thing he focused on most, rather than what he wanted or what somebody in the program thought they wanted. They, they wanted the car to be best for the guys that were going to actually buy it. <laughs> Jinbai Tai uh, is this phrase that came up and it meant horse and rider is one, which described what the car had to be. And that was Mr. Hirai the program manager who coined that phrase and got everybody on the same page immediately because you could always understand it. Oh yeah, that's perfect. Okay. How you feel the progression has come with now? Did it lose its way at all? Did it lose its way and come back? Was it always on target? How do you feel if the, uh, it has gone in 2018? 
25 years. It's, th that, this is interesting. If you do a car for throwing the years out, just for four generations, there will have to be some interpretation of the concept along the route. Partially because of the, the world's different, okay? You couldn't do a first generation, and let's say we're doing the first Miata today, it wouldn't be like the first Miata because it has stiffer crash standards it has to deal with, different expectations for the customer. But if you look at the first generation, second generation, third generation, and the next generation, they have this, this common DNA that comes through on the basics of the vehicle concept, okay? It's engaging to the driver. It makes you feel good to drive it, okay? It's, it's about the experience. It's not, it's not the fastest car in the world, and it's not supposed to be, okay? It's, it's, it's not about zero to 60 times. It's not about quarter miles. It's not about miles per gallon. It's about smiles per gallon, okay? It, the whole thing in the car is, is that you drive it, you feel better, okay? And if you drive a, an NA or an NB, NC, so first, second, third generation, they've all been like that. They're different, you know, it's, it's, and, and I say to people, you know, my personal favorite, because I'm, I'm a vain SOB, is the first generation car. I love it, I had a lot to do with it. But I will say this, the current car is a better car. And as, you know, I once said, it's, it's, it's it, the MX-5, the first generation is a, better, is a better Miata than the current one, but the difference is very slight. Okay, very, very slight. Uh, not enough that it would make much difference because just as the 1989 car was a reflection of 1989, the current car is a reflection of current conditions. And the next one, by the reduced weight and other things, is going to go even better. I think. Were you surprised by the immediate success and continuing success of the car? <sighs> My surprise over the, the, the success of the car when it launched was I was surprised at the same time I wasn't surprised. I, I knew it was going to be successful. I was surprised at the intensity of the success. It was more successful than I was imagining it would be. The big surprise for me was Japan. We assumed we might do about 30 to 40,000 in the States per year. In Japan, they were expecting 500 cars per month, 6,000 per year. They ended up running between two and 3,000 a month in a market that didn't take sports cars. So that was the one that shocked all of us. Me, the Japanese weren't even ready for it. And it was such a problem that they had difficulty making enough wheels for the car. <laughs> okay. um, so the intensity of it surprised me. The longevity of it, I had no doubts when we did the first car, particularly after about the first quarter of 1991 when it had really done, there was this Miata mania with people paying $4,000, $6,000 over sticker. I knew it would go two generations without a problem because even if the second generation car was kind of screwed up, there would be enough inertia. But it wasn't screwed up, it was a good car. So the third generation, even though I didn't, I wasn't thinking there would be a third generation, I, I wasn't surprised when the third generation came. And I'm not surprised they're going into fourth generation, to be honest. And I think that, you know, as long as the car keeps those, those key aspects of driver involvement and being enjoyable, as long as it does that, as long as it's relevant to the marketplace, it can go on forever. I mean, that, that class of those lightweight sports cars started around 1914, and they're still with us. Now, they aren't like they used to be. They've got brakes on all four wheels. The brakes are hydraulic. They've got real engines in them. But the philosophy behind the car is the same. So who knows? Maybe there'll be a, a, 20, a 2089 Miata that's electric or uses a cosmoid cell, okay, with free electrons, and, uh, and it's not autonomous because the autonomous cars fail because of legal problems. And who can say? You know, it, it, and, and just because you make a Miata that's electric or hybrid or whatever, or, you know, personal favorite, what I would love to see is a next generation car with a sky active diesel. People think you're nuts. Diesel sports car? But, but my viewpoint is a diesel is the torque of the town, okay? And you, you, got, a, you got a car that's, that's going to be 100 kilos, 220 pounds, 100 kilos lighter, okay? And it's got that kind of torque from a turbo diesel. Sign me up. And I just hope Mazda do it, okay? How do you feel? How does it make you feel to be the father of the Miata? What has it been to you? I mean, what kind of... Success, how successful, what kind of success has this been to you? And I want you just to tell me. Well, 
every time I see a Miata and I see somebody driving it and they're smiling, it's like, it's great, it's great. It, it's like, yeah, that was, that was, I did a good job. Um, I, I still am uncomfortable with the whole concept of the father of the Miata, but I mean, the cars are like movies, okay? North by Northwest, one of Hitchcock's greatest films. Nobody says, ah, that's an Ernst Lehmann film. Because Ernst wrote the script. It isn't, okay? Maybe if we're talking the Miata as a movie, it's Mr. He Rye's movie. I wrote the script, okay? But he made the movie, and he deserves the credit. I had a job that I did. I'm very proud of it. It's, I, it was the best time of my life. It was frustrating as hell. Um, but I love it, and, and if I, they said you got to do it all again, I'd do it all again. And I'd do it again and again and again. Are you a little beefy? Yeah, I am, actually. I'm a little beefy right here. I mean, it's like, like the, 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 the epochal moment, epochal, that's not the word. The, 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 the thing with me when I, I, I knew things were right was when we showed the car to the dealers in Nashville. And they had this great movie they put together with it, and they drove the car through. I'm at the back of the damn place. Everybody stands up, standing ovation. I couldn't see the car. And made it all worthwhile.